Good afternoon. I hope everybody enjoyed your lunches. We're, we've got some people kind of straggling in. We've also lost a couple people, so if everybody can kind of scoot towards the middle, that way uh, everybody can get a closer view, that would be great. Um, before we kick off our next panel, we're really honored to have uh, the Dean of the UTSA College of Public Policy here, um, and we're going to just, he's gonna give a couple words and that kind of thing, so uh, Dean Signs, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to our beautiful downtown campus, and I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, Drew for bringing the uh, conference here, uh, and um, I think uh, this is a great place to to have the conference and engage students and so forth. A little bit about the uh, the college: we're located here in the downtown campus. About 1,500 students, about a third are graduate students, so we have a uh, graduate programs in. Uh, criminal justice and public administration uh, and social work, and then a PhD program in, uh, in demography. We also have undergraduate programs in criminal justice and, uh, and public administration. Uh, we have wonderful students, students who are do, uh, doing a lot of uh, great work. Um, in the city here in San Antonio, there's a, um, a it's not a contest, it's a recognition for the top individuals, the movers and shakers uh, that are under age 40. Uh, so it's called the 40 under 40. And typically we have a number of our, of our students that graduate from our uh, College of Public Policy that are among those, uh, those students. We also have a couple of our students then that were selected to go to the, uh, uh, to, to the Archer program in Washington, D.C., Archer scholars and, and uh, so forth. So there's a lot of really great things going on. Uh, I love my job because it's one that allows the intersection between research, teaching, and community engagement. So very much in line with, uh, with the mission of this, uh, this particular conference, trying to bring that conversation between academicians, uh, instructors, and then people in, in the community. And there's uh, um, some of our students uh, are here. Uh, they're doing great work. Uh, obviously, Drew is uh, one of our students who finished uh, our program uh, a year or two ago, I believe. Uh, Chris Stewart is here, Chris, uh, there he is. Uh, and then we also had uh, Zach, um, Zach Dunn, who was our president here as well. Uh, and it's great to see, I think, the ray of hope of, uh, of young people going into these professions, particularly when we see kind of the ugliness that we see on the national debates uh, taking place. So it's a really nice re uh, uh, ray of hope. Uh, and for instructors, professors, educators, and so forth, it's wonderful to see people that, that go through our programs that become leaders. Uh, earlier, uh, Representative Mike Villarreal was here. Um, I was at a professor at Texas A&M where he was an undergraduate student. He worked for me as a work study uh, student. He was doing research for me. So it's great to see the, uh, students then as their college students and they make their mark and go on to, uh, to accomplish great things. So th again, uh, I'd like to welcome you, and uh, I've been enjoying this, uh, this conference uh, a lot, and will continue being here the rest of the afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Sines. Um, we're really, really excited about this next panel. Um, this, uh, our, pa our third panel of the day is Innovating Your Career. Um, and so this is really going to discuss how you can branch out. Um, it's not all about going to law school and, uh, and, that, and as your path to elected official. Um, if you want to work in the private sector, you can do that. And so we've got some really, really great uh, guests here today. I'm going to introduce the moderator, and then uh, Dr. Hayamio is going to introduce the rest of the panel. So our moderator today is Dr. Patricia Hayamio. Um, she is an associate uh, professor here at the Department of, Pu of Public Administration uh, at UTSA, um, and she is a 2015 uh, Regents Award winner, outstanding uh, teacher, um, and she specializes specifically in Latino, Latina, um, pol political uh, political education. So so um, thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Jaime, I'll let you introduce the panel. OK. Is this, I guess this is active. Yeah. Um, so we have a wonderful panel, again, to reiterate what Drew uh, so, yeah. said. And, and also, uh, thanks for the promotion, Drew, because you just moved me from lecture to associate professor. So <laughs> um, 
but we have a great panel. We have uh, Dia Campos uh, from HEB, uh, Brian Halderman from here at UTSA, and Kathy Garcia uh, from CPS. And so we're going to talk, as Drew said, about uh, life in politics, being engaged in the public sector beyond the elected and running for public office. So what I asked our panelists to actually start with is telling you their path uh, to their current career and current position. And if you'll go ahead and, and give your formal position as well. So Dia, do you want to start? All right, I'll go first. Um, I'm going to try to take this really long, complicated story of mysteries and truncate <laughs> it into a couple of minutes. But um, my name's Dia Campos. I'm currently the Director of Public and Government Affairs for HEB which many of you know we're headquartered here in San Antonio and we're the um, largest privately held employer in Texas. Um, my path to a career in politics um, is uh, interesting. I started as an undergraduate. Well, first of all, um, back my family it was always politically active. I grew up in Kyle, Texas, Hayes County. Um, election day was a holiday in my family. Um, everyone got to take off of school, and we all worked the polls for somebody that my family was supporting. And so grew up in a very civically active um, family in Kyle, and um, went on to undergraduate at Southwestern University, where I met Dr. Jaramillo, who was uh, one of my professors, I guess maybe my sophomore or junior year, I can't recall. Um, and at Southwestern, I uh, thought I wanted to go to law school, like everybody. Um, typically does, who's civically minded. I think that is the only path to civic engagement. Um, so I started off in you know, pre-law and um, picked the best law firm in Texas at the time, Vincent and Elkins Law Firm, to intern at. Got into their pre-law internship program, which is pretty um, vigorous, very highly competitive uh, program. And ended up working in the public policy section for Vincent and Elkins Law Firm. Um, which was a great learning experience for me. I quickly discovered I did not want to be a lawyer working, <laughs> working in a law firm for four years during undergrad. You get to see a lot of what being a lawyer really means, and I realized that was not the kind of impact I, I was probably best suited for. And um, I decided, um, you know, I really liked working in the public policy division. I would be late nights at the Capitol, um, watching the Appropriations Committee until 2, 3 a.m. It's kind of fascinating seeing how, how the law is really made. Um, then got involved in several political races. I worked on several campaigns um, throughout undergrad, undergraduate school and uh, met a lot of great people, some of the best people, some of the best friends in, in my life. Uh, I met through politics, through um, working in the Capitol. After undergrad, um, I worked for Vincent and Elkins Law Firm as a lobbyist. I was a lo uh, youngest lobbyist in the state of Texas at the age of 21 at that time, and then got recruited by Hilco Partners, which is uh, one of the largest lobbying firms in the state. Um, worked for Hilco Partners and several clients of Hilco for a couple of sessions where, and then I realized that uh, when you're working as a consultant in any field, not just political consulting, um, you know, it wears on you and you get to know different personalities of your clients, and one of my clients was HEB at the time. And at the time, that was 2006, maybe, um, HEB only lobbied for public education issues. They were really not concerned about business tax issues or other business issues that were impacting them at the Capitol. And I thought that was kind of interesting for such a large company. Um, so they were my favorite client. And, and I thought to myself, if I was going to, going to do this in-house somewhere or for anybody else, um, I would want to be at HEB. And so 10 years later, uh, here I am at HEB. My responsibilities cover um, being the media spokesperson for the company and also charitable giving, community relations, and government affairs. When I came to the company, HEB really didn't have a government affairs division. And so we've slowly created that um, over these past 10 years. And I now manage our state lobby team, which does include my former employer, Hilco. That's, that's always fun and interesting. Um, but I um, feel really, really uh, blessed to be in this role and to be advocating at the state capitol on behalf of a really great company. Brian? Thank you. Um, so my path to, to where I'm at now is kind of also an interesting one. Um, 
and a little bit meandering, so I'll try to summarize. Um, I think I grew up in a, in a household also that was uh, very interested and engaged in the community and in the political arena. Um, I grew up in a divided household. My father was a uh, registered Republican. My mother, Democrat, was like that all, all of their lives, so that made for interesting table conversation. Um, so uh, I, I kind of always had an interest in service and serving others um, from, being, from very young. And so when I went off to, to college, I was really unsure exactly what to major in or, or where I wanted to go. Um, and I actually was thinking about becoming a Roman Catholic priest when I, when I went off to, to college. Um, and so I ended up going to uh, the University of Dayton, a Catholic university in Ohio. I'm from northern Kentucky, Cincinnati area originally. Um, and ended up studying religious studies theology for my undergraduate with a minor in social work. Um, and so I did that path and, and it was good. It was a really um, robust uh, liberal arts education and I'm really grateful that I, I had that um, as my undergraduate degree. Um, but ultimately I didn't end up going that path um, for myself. I ended up um, in St. Louis working, eventually in St. Louis working on a master's degree after a couple of years of working. Um, and worked on a master's in social work um, at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, a very reputable social work program. And my focus always really wanted to be sort of um, a macro perspective of the profession. So looking at public policy development, um, my concentration in the program was social and economic development, um, sort of with an international focus. Uh, ended up doing my, my final field placement with the program in Peru for a year, um, working in a sort of a post-secondary school, doing a lot of grant writing and studying employability of minority youth in Peru. Um, and so that was a really fascinating experience. I got to work with a lot of uh, Latin American scholars who were studying issues of employability and uh, sort of uh, oppression of, of minority youth in in Central America, Latin America, Central and South America. Um, so that was a, a really enriching experience for me and also helped me work on my Spanish. I ended up staying a year in Peru working on Spanish. I uh, came to San Antonio after that year to work at St. Mary's University where I took a position that was sort of kind of a love of both um, interests. So I became the university minister for social justice uh, where I was sort of engaging that undergraduate piece of, of of my studies in, in theology and religious studies with an interest in sort of social justice and advancing the common good and doing a lot of uh, developing really, um, this was the, I was the first person in that position at St. Mary's, so developing a lot of programming for students um, that, was, that were engaging them in the community, helping them see uh, some of the challenges, uh, social challenges our community might have faced, um, really engaging them in reflection on those issues uh, supporting some of the service learning initiatives at the university. And then that brought me here to um, UTSA. I've been here two years now, and I serve as the director of the Center for uh, Civic Engagement here at UTSA. Um, a fairly new entity at UTSA, not new totally to higher education. So um, one of the things when I started working in higher education was I really wasn't aware that there are civic engagement or community engagement professionals in higher education. It is a sort of growing recognition or growing movement that you can have a career in higher education as a community engagement professional. Um, and we do a variety of things, but principally our work is to really live out that public service mission of the institutions. Um, so almost every institution of higher ed, whether private or public, um, has something in their mission. Some aspect of their mission that's about engaging um, the, the public you know, public service angle or advancing the common good, advancing the public good, you, you hear different language for that. Um, and so that's really kind of the realm I'm in, I would say, in terms of my, my social work education really prepared me well to do this type of work. Um, it, it's a lot of bridge building between the community and the institution, helping students be engaged uh, through service learning courses, through extracurricular uh, types of community engagement initiatives, uh, through programming like, like this uh, to, to really elevate the conversation on civic engagement. Um, and so I've really enjoyed that, that journey to where I am now and um, I really do think that sort of that liberal arts base and my, my focus professional studies and social work has really prepared me well to do what I'm doing now. So I'll leave it there.
Thank you, Brian. Uh -huh. Kathy? Um, so I am responsible for the advocacy work for CPS Energy uh, at the state and the federal level. And um, being all in San Antonio, I presume you are aware, but I'll mention the uh, fact that CPS Energy is uh, the nation's largest municipally owned electric and natural gas utility. So it's a, it's a unique and uh, fun, exciting opportunity to be in this position to be messaging on uh, um, policy matters that are of interest to CPS Energy, both at the state and the federal level. And how I arrived at this position uh, is a resemblant of, of what you've heard the other panelists mention, uh, uh, raised by my parents to think about and understand uh, public, uh, public issues and current events and be able to speak about those at home. Uh, and I've also arrived at the position I'm at right now uh, with the help and the guidance of mentors, which I found particularly helpful to me throughout my entire career. Uh, and then I entered this work arena with the help of internships and non-paid internships at that. So uh, when, I, uh, when I was growing up, I mentioned that we talked about current affairs in my household quite a bit. Uh, I knew that I wanted to go to the University of Texas at Austin. I knew I wanted to be a government major. I knew I wanted to work around public policy. So I accomplished those things, and then while I was at, at, at the university, I interned, and I literally walked into the doors of city council here in San Antonio one summer and said, who will take a free intern? And that was my entrance into, into the work environment. I, uh, I did an internship for District 5 on the west side of San Antonio, and I did that every day for the three months I was here uh, uh, for that summer. And then from there, that particular internship has pretty much shaped and molded my career going forward. It's had an impact in my job every which way. Uh, when I went back to school to complete my, my undergrad, uh, I got an internship at the Attorney General's office. Again, an unpaid internship. Uh, but I was put into the Intergovernmental Relations Department and got a broad spectrum of what state agency is about. State agencies don't, don't advocate. They don't lobby but they are responsible for monitoring all the activities that are going on in and around the legislature as well as inside each state agency. So from the Attorney General's perspective, you're supposed to represent those state agencies in any kind of legal battle. And uh, I worked on a team that, that got broad knowledge of state government across the board. It's a really exciting opportunity. And that unpaid internship actually led to a paid job at the Attorney General's office. I worked in what was called the Citizens Advisory Committee, and uh, we answered constituent calls and letters that came into the Attorney General, a lot from people who thought the Attorney General could help them directly. And since the Attorney General represents the state, uh, these folks needed to know where to go to go get some help. And so our unit was there to help direct and to advise, and we really had some very unique success stories out of that department. In one instance, we actually helped a, a couple who was looking to adopt, and they had trouble finding their way through the system, and as, in, at the end, it was successful. I held on to that letter as a, as a neat token of, of success there. Uh, and so from there, uh, the Attorney General's office um, had asked that I take over correspondence that was coming in from elected officials to the Attorney General directly. So I did a lot of writing on behalf of the Attorney General. I had to think about what that attorney general would say in response to certain inquiries coming into their office. Um, so that was a, an interesting way to have to think, like what would an elected or an appointed official do when they're posed with questions. So I got an opportunity to see state government from that side. And from there, I, I transferred over to a private lobby firm. So I worked in the private sector for several years uh, and represented a number of clients whether it was the crop dusters or the marriage and family therapists. Uh, we had the Texas State Judges Association. So in the private firm, we represented a whole bunch of different clients, much like what Dio was talking about with Hilco. And similar to her story, we represented the city of San Antonio, and we represented uh, a number of the chambers of commerce, including the greater chamber. And uh, I learned that CPS Energy had an Austin-based office in which to do the, the advocacy work for the utility. And so I, my name was tossed into a pool of candidates, uh, and that came from the link of representing the city, the city entities. 
And from there, I was hired to come on board with CPS Energy. And I've been there now for 16 years. So that's my story. Thank you. Um, and I think I said careers in the public sector, but it's really careers in politics. And when we talk about the sectors, recognize that uh, we're talking about the private sector, which we see with uh, HEB. We have the public sector and CPS, or quasi-public, right? Public? Municipally, yes, yes. municipal. And, um, and then academic uh, or nonprofit sector, which is a huge third sector now. Uh, one of the questions that we'd like to, uh, to know from you all is, what do you see as the relationship between the different sectors? Public, private, nonprofit, academic, uh, and how do you navigate those sectors? Uh, Kathy, you want to start? Sure. So I think that uh, San Antonio entities are always going to come together to help the interests of San Antonio causes, uh, whether it's private or public. Uh, for CPS Energy, being a government entity, there's several things that we cannot do. And there are things that private entities can do. And so we look for, pri for public-private partnerships in order to uh, further whatever the goal might be for the community. Um, an example that I can give in my particular arena is that uh, there are tax incentives for renewable energy. And the community has stated that they'd like to see wind and solar developed. And in order to bring that online, it's, it's a cost. And there are tax incentives that are offered to entities that are taxable. And so we have partnered with those entities so that they can achieve the, the cost savings and they own the infrastructure, they build the infrastructure, and then we buy the power. And it, so it's a partnership in order to bring something to the community um, that crosses both sectors. And again, I would bring it home too, whenever there's a legislative session or there's an item that's before Congress and it's San Antonio based, the San Antonio entities will often come together uh, and, and rally for those causes to bring the benefits back to the community. I would add in, in my role, um, Part of what, what I see is, is, is my effort is to leverage the resources of the institution of higher ed in the community or for the good of the community. So when I see opportunities to help leverage expertise of scholars on campus um, to bring to bear to you know, a particular critical need of the community, trying to help those relationships happen. So um, even just recently had a meeting with the mayor talking about some of her, her policy priorities and thinking about who on campus can we connect to, to the mayor's office to help initiate some research initiatives or engage undergraduate students in those efforts, et cetera. So that's a lot of, of my uh, role is sort of bridging those divides between entities and institutions. Um, and I also see that too with, with the nonprofit sector and some of the public sector and a little bit of the private sector too in terms of where students are doing volunteer service, internship placements, or engagement like that in the community and sort of ensuring that we have good, mutually beneficial relationships between those entities, the, through between those different sectors. So obviously hosting events here on campus to bring those together for conversation, um, you know, those kinds of things to ensure that we, there's some mutuality in our work um, and, and that it's sustainable because obviously that's an important part. We don't want to just send students in and out of, a, of an agency or um, with the sector, but we'd really like to have a sustained relationship where it's really beneficial to, to, to both parties. Yeah, I would agree. Um, so approaching issues in the legislature, um, you have to really know your stakeholder group. You have to look at who, what person is going to be against me, who's going to be for me, who are all the stakeholders. And when you look at that stakeholder list, it's usually uh, public se sector, private sector, and a lot of academia is involved, you know, specifically like in, we do a lot of work in the transportation um, arena. HEB has almost 400 uh, tractors and trailers going up and down Texas highways every day. Um, it's a big issue for us, but when you look at the transportation issue as a whole, there's a lot of academia involved. You know, we partner with Texas A&M, who is doing this robust study about how to move um, cargo up and down highways in a more efficient and safe way. And in that you have the public se sector with TxDOT and different municipalities and, and the state as well. So when you're approaching issues um, in, in any um, realm of conflict, whether it's in a public affairs arena or in a legislative arena, 
you always look at that stakeholder group. And when you look at your, your stakeholders, you'll always see a cross, a cross section of interest. Thank you. Um, what about issues of board service and volunteerism? How are those important today uh, in your world? And how can students uh, think about getting involved? I'll go first on that. Um, you know, HEB is extremely passionate about volunteerism, and we actually use board service in our corporation as a form of uh, leadership development. So my department works really close with HR to identify who are those up-and-coming leaders in our company that um, need to get experience that are outside of the company. Serving on a board is the best way to expand your network and to expand your understanding of how things work. Um, so when we place people in our corporation on boards, we expect them to understand the financials. You know, if it's somebody who's not strong in the, in the realm of you know, financial accounting, you know, this is their opportunity to, to step outside of the company and really learn that from other people on the board who are, who are experts. So board service is, is definitely a sign of leadership. It's a way to expand your network and um, a way to really take the opportunity to learn something and sharpen your skills in areas that you may not, not be great in. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the thing I'll add to that too is I think it's important to identify things in the community that you're passionate about to connect with. So either through your volunteerism, if there's particular issues you're passionate about, to be engaged in those issues. And, and I think board service and, and further engagement with agencies come with time, obviously. Um, but if, if an agency or an organization sees you as being a committed volunteer, sees you as engaged with the issue, sees you as knowledgeable about the issue, then that's when the invitations come to be engaged at, at the board level or to be engaged in that way. So, so that would be my advice to students is, as you're thinking about ways to be further engaged in things like volunteers and then board service, to really find that niche for yourself of, of an issue you're passionate about uh, and, and really stick with it. And I, I would say that whether it's running a marathon or working as an employee at a nonprofit or serving in an elected official capacity, um, volunteering is about changing lives, about improving lives, and it comes from a basis of, of wanting to do that. And as Brian mentioned, that you find the things that you're passionate about and, and you can find ways to in your, insert yourself and to make a difference. Uh, I think the, the board, serving on boards and, and becoming uh, uh, leaders on committees, uh, working groups are all fantastic ways to become an active participant. You all know, you all know you can do something and you can probably do it better than what's currently occurring. So it, it's very inspiring and motivating to find that opportunity and insert yourself and, and make a difference. Uh, CPS Energy, very much like HEB, uses a program in-house. We look for those up-and-coming leaders and we, we, we help them find and identify opportunities for them to serve, whether it's in our, our state or our federal trade associations or whether it is on entities of civic engagement, uh, and, and help them achieve those positions. And, and uh, it is about making connections with people. It is a network that becomes part of of who you are, either internal to your, your organization as well as external to the community. Fantastic way to get engaged. Okay, I wanna ask one question that wasn't there ahead of time, which was essentially, what do you see as um, one skill that was your strength in helping you through your career path? And how did you develop that skill? Um, I think, uh, especially in, so career, a career in politics and a career in policy are two totally separate things. <laughs> um, if you guys are interested in a career in politics, um, you know, I, I think in, in understanding that politics is cyclical. You know, there are ups and downs and the Republicans might be in, in play in 10 years, that's going to switch, and the parties change and redefine themselves. Just understanding um, and having this serenity around understanding that politics is cyclical, and your relationships, building relationships is probably the key thing. And that doesn't mean building relationships just with Democrats or just with Republicans. 
um, because people change. And um, you, the, your ability to have an impact on policy revolves around your relationships across the board. Um, your ability to be gainfully employed <laughs> revolves on relationships across the board. I've seen a lot of um, friends of mine who have worked in the Capitol who are very dedicated uh, go on to have amazing, amazing careers, uh, either in the private sector or still in the public sector, but it's because of your relationships. So don't build relationships based on political party. Build relationships based on people who you trust, people who um, mirror, uh, who, who have skills that you would like to mirror. Go and seek those people out. If you see somebody who's really, um, you know, you like their, their calmness, you like the way that they think about things, you, Make those people your friends. It's not about it's not about political party. Um, uh, other skills are perseverance and resilience, and and that carries into the corporate world. If you are, are, have the ability to take feedback, ask for feedback from people, take it and change and be resilient and and be able to fail and have setbacks and overcome that. Um, I think that is the the number one. Uh, quality and trait that you can develop as a leader, something that you can be mindful about and strengthen and strengthen, and that will, will you know, change your, your trajectory in life. One of the thoughts that I had was um, about a skill that I think takes time to really develop is um, this idea of sort of being humbly confident in what you're doing. Um, and, I, and I add the word humble or humbling to that because you can also be cocky about your confidence, right? And, and not come off well to people or individuals. Um, and, and that's not helpful for building those relationships, which I think is really key and critical uh, to being successful. So being confident about your skill set, about your education, about where you're at, but in a, in a way that's, that's, that's with humility, um, I think is super important. Um, and I lost the other one I had. I had two that I had, but maybe I'll come back to it. <laughs> so I, I'll try to build off what you've heard in terms of relationships and uh, having humble confidence, which I think is a, a great skill sets to pay attention to. Uh, I would say that to, to add to that, uh, it's about being diplomatic and tactful. Uh, it's a skill set that I do think takes time to hone in. Um, when to know to be bold in a conversation and when to listen. Uh, those are things that in time, it's, it's not like you necessarily learn that in a classroom. You, you learn that by being maybe in an internship or in a, in a volunteer role where you get technical skills and you gain social skills and you, you learn when the moment's right to actually be bold in your statements, to be assertive. And then you also learn when the right time is to listen and to maybe take ideas back. And maybe you come back a day later and you're bold in the same, in the same conversation. But knowing when and how to use those skill sets and to really um, uh, work on perfecting those, I think can make you very, very successful in whether it's politics or in working in and around policy. Thank you. Brian, do you remember? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in thinking about when you hire, uh, what kind of skills do you look for when you are hiring? And how can the students or those who are entering um, the workforce build those skills? So uh, I think uh, uh, depending on the role that they're going to fill within your, your area, but at large, um, it goes without saying that you want uh, excellent writing and, and oral skills. I think that's kind of a given. Uh, but I would look for and help someone gain how to become concise and very articulate. Uh, there are times where in a position of, of talking on policy or politics, you might get 15 minutes to explain a perspective, or you might get 15 seconds. And so being able to adapt to whichever the situation might be, and to be prepared with details, and to be prepared with the one statement you want people to leave with. So in hiring, and in interviewing skills, I would look for someone who's articulate and someone who can be concise. Um, 
Another thing that I would look for based on this type of role, sp specifically for, let's say, lobbying or, or government relations affairs, would be outgoing. I, I, it doesn't mean that an introvert, per se, can't do this type of role. But it, but it, someone who is, is comfortable at being outgoing and is seeking conversation uh, is going to be just a bit more comfortable and maybe not as taxed at the end of the day um, because it is something that, that they almost refuel by doing. Um, I have uh, two people on my team, one that's very extroverted and one that's introverted, and I've hired them for different reasons. The, the person who's a little bit more introverted can certainly do the same that the extrovert is doing, but he's an excellent writer, he's an excellent reporter, and he brings back information, reports it back to the, to the utility in a, a very excellent manner. And the, the other person is able to be the outward sp uh, spokesperson to, to engage and to build those relationships. And so in hiring, those are, those are some, some criteria, some skill sets that I would look for. I, was, I thought of my other one. It was, um, <laughs> so being inquisitive was the other skill that I thought was really important to because particularly when you're thinking about public policy, there's always, there's always another side of the story. There's always another angle. So be, having that skill and developing that skill to dig deeper, to do the research that you need to do, um, I think it's important. But, but in, it relates really to this topic in terms of things that I would be looking for in an individual to support our work is the other thing I would add to what, to what Kathy has said is, is a critical thinker, somebody who can really carefully analyze and think through situations um, and, and do the research that needs to get done so that we're really informed on all angles of issues um, before kind of moving forward. Um, and so I think even in the work that, that we do here at the institution is sort of understanding and knowing the resources that we have as an institution, how to, how to leverage those well in the community, but also it requires us to really know the issues in the community well. Um, and so having somebody that can help us really do that is something that I'm looking for in, in folks that would be working with us. Um, I look for authenticity. I want to know if you know who you are and why you do the things that you do. So I ask a lot of questions in interviews about um, how you feel about certain things, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, what do you, who are you as a person? Um, and, and hiring spokespeople for a company, a really large company with a lot of complex issues, um, being authentic and knowing who you are um, will give me a good um, feel of how you're going to react under pressure. Mm -hmm. So reacting under pressure, under um, speaking in, in public forums, or whether it be in a group of media, of uh, journalists badgering you with questions, I want to make sure that you're comfortable and confident and uh, you know why you do the things you do, why you believe the things you, you do. And um, so that's, that's really important for me as well as, uh, of course, the communication skills is, is, uh, is a given. But I think authenticity and confidence and, and presence is something that uh, is important, uh, at least for, for us when we're hiring on the, on the public affairs side of the business. Good. Um, well, I think this is really, really informative because so much of what we heard this morning had to do around, had revolved around electeds and running for office and um, having an impact in the, the information in terms of careers in, in politics goes well beyond that. And it's often careers that we're not always familiar with uh, and we don't know how to make our way into those areas. Um, so what I'd like to do is open, open up uh, questions from the audience because I believe that um, they provide, our panelists provide such interesting perspective coming from a different kind of world that we're not familiar with. Um, dealing with politicians and elected officials, what would, what would you say is um, the, kind of the approach that you, that you go into their office with? Do you have to approach them a certain way? Um, are you worried about them kind of you know, dealing you or are you trying to like pull something on them? I mean, how do you expect day-to-day -day businesses to be conducted in you know, the capital, say? Well, from, I mean, from my experience, it's, it's different. So I spend a lot of time getting to know who they are. Um, but they're, I mean, I study uh, any elected official extensively before I go in and talk to them. I want to know 
what they do for a living, who their parents were, where they grew up, what's meaningful to them, what church they go to, how many kids they have. I do all of that, um, that background work before I walk in. And it's different working in, in house in a, in a large company. Um, typically the first thing I get asked when I, walked in, when I walk into a legislator's office is, you know, I love my HEB, you know, we need an HEB in my town, if it's somebody in, in North Texas. Um, and so once we get past all of that, you know, we get down to, okay, here's a policy that we're working on. And I always try to find something that is beneficial to them and their communities and their constituencies. Um, and it's just HEB has a very different style and approach to government affairs than, than um, a lot of other companies that, that I've represented in the past. And so through my experience of lobbying for numerous different companies, everybody from the Dallas Cowboys, the Houston Rockets, to, uh, AT&T has been a client. And so after gaining all that experience and learning the styles of different companies, um, we've cultivated a culture of government affairs at HEB that is more of a shared value culture. You guys may have read about shared value concept um, from um, a lot of that is discussed from uh, Harvard Business School, Clay Christensen, and this concept of shared value. But when you look at that in, in terms of government affairs, really uh, finding a, a common shared interest that you have with an elected official and their constituency and being able to bridge that, that gap that you may have with them is really a, a really powerful thing and actually extremely rewarding. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, a lot of my work is with municipal government, so in terms of city council and, and, and the county officials. And again, it, it kind of goes back to the, to, to the shared values ideas, is working with them on issues that they're concerned about for their constituents, for their district, where the university can, can bear some resources or be helpful to them. And so that's kind of the approach that I always take. But it's also about building relationships, right? So now it's to the point where you know, most of the city council knows who I am and the role I have at the university and feels comfortable calling me up or sending me an email when, when they need something. And so that's part of the idea as well. It's a partnership. You, you're going into that office and you're going to meet with that member or their chief of staff, their legislative director, and they need to get to know you. You have to allow them that opportunity to, to visit with you, to share what, what they feel is important, their perspectives on things, and, and just listen. And over time, you become a trusted resource. And it's really not until you become that trusted resource that you can really find that true partnership working. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do that. Uh, as you've heard the other two panelists mention, the relationships is so critical to being able to be successful. But it's not just about CPS Energy's success. It's also about the success of the delegation that's representing us. And so together in that, in that partnership and in that trusted resource, uh, when, when we go to visit with members, we not only need to explain our perspective on something, but we need to be able to say what the other stakeholders' perspectives are. We need to be uh, upfront and, and understand and know who's going to come in and speak something different and prepare them for that type of, of dialogue and maybe even controversy at times. Um, sometimes you're going to agree to disagree, and that's going to be okay too, provided you've been uh, true and you've been honest and forthcoming in the things that you know. And over time, you really do develop a very powerful partnership. Uh, they want to do good by representing you. They care about you as a constituent or as a company that's in their district. And what can they do to help you? And then what can you do to help them help you? So it's a very cyclical thing. I think a good case study for you guys, if you're truly interested, would be this past session, the uh, Tesla Motor Company versus the automobile dealers. This past session was a great, great case study. And I'm a huge Elon Musk fan. You know, I'm a huge fan of Tesla, so there's my disclaimer, camera. Um, <laughs> but it was really interesting how they decided to handle the politics of influence, of influencing legislators, because, you know, uh, they developed this huge uh, political action committee and threw a ton of money at the issue and that's the one thing I think that um, that is kind of a, a a myth in politics is the more money you throw at it the uh, you'll get what you want and this is a great case that resembles that's not exactly how it works um, you have to build relationships you have to 
come to a middle ground, you, you know, writing huge checks, especially um, in one election cycle, <laughs> is, is not going to necessarily help. So if anyone's really interested in it, I think that's a great case study to look at. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. So how did you find yourselves where you are? Uh, was it a planned progression? Did you see yourselves being where you are now and work towards that? Or was it just kind of a happenstance progression through your career and now you're just doing what you're doing because you're good at it? Um, and that being said, how do you deal with the negative stigma of being a lobbyist? Yeah, <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, I'm sure others up here will get asked this too, but I, I'll find myself in a situation where someone will say, what do you do? And I'll say, I'm in government relations. And they'll look at me and say, what is that? And then I say, I'm a lobbyist. And they go, oh. And so th that's a great question. And there are words that just sometimes have negative connotations to them. Um, and that's kind of unfortunate in this world, but it is, it is, the, it is the case. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that. But I generally, when I find myself in a situation trying to explain or handle the negativity that's associated with lobbying, um, there is absolutely no way that our elected officials or appointed officials can know everything about everything. And they do need someone to help them understand the issue. Again, you might agree to disagree. But they need people that they can trust and that they can receive information from. And so it is a valuable part of the process. And that is being able to go in and explain, explain an issue, explain a perspective. And, uh, and the folks that I continue to talk with about the negativity of it, um, there, there is great opportunity for the industry as a whole to, to change that over time. But I do, I do believe that uh, the liaison work that occurs between the lobby and whoever is being lobbied uh, is an essential part of education. It's an essential part of being able to share a perspective. Um, and then I think, and I'll stop there and see if others want to answer that, and then we can take on your, your other question. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I don't necessarily do lobby work, so, so I'm off the hook a little bit on that one. But in terms of where I'm at now, no, I really did not see myself where I'm at now. Um, and so in some ways, I'm grateful for the opportunities that have presented themselves for me to be where I am. But I would say, uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's also sort of looking at it as a challenge to grow into any particular position you may take on, um, you know, and to be open to the opportunity to learn in those new positions. Um, you know, for example, the transition I made from, from private higher education to public higher education was huge. It's like, it's a different world. And so having to learn that, that difference and that challenge and to get, execute the work and, and vision that I want for, for the center here at UTSA was a, was a whole, whole new ball game for me. And so you know, not being afraid of those challenges when you have opportunities presented to you, I think, for your, for your future career and to kind of take them on is, would be my advice. You know, mine, uh, I'm, it's, it's a constant tug of war for me. Uh, every day I think I wake up and I just want to do product development at HEB. <laughs> and, and not, and not, because it's difficult. And, and doing government affairs in a really large company in a changing landscape where you have 20 new members of the legislature every cycle, it's really difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just this, this tug. I keep getting pulled back into it. And, you know, after undergrad, all we want is a job. You know, and so when I was offered a full-time job at Vincent Elkins Law Firm lobbying right out of undergraduate school, um, you know, I, I couldn't turn that down. The job market was so tight. And, um, you know, after I did that, I, I, we had a, a lawyer in our firm, Dixon Montague, who was a great man, uh, represented a lot of companies in an eminent domain issue. And I took the issue very seriously. And, and the way that I became a great lobbyist is reading. I read the rules. And that's rarely something people do, because there are a lot of them. And it's very easy to kill bills if you know the rules. And um, I knew the rules better than anybody. And uh, we, uh, Vincent and Elkins, had a huge win over a, a very popular home builder who has now passed on, Bob Perry, um, 
who were, they were in the middle of this huge legislative battle, Harris County issue, and we beat them. And it's very rare that Hillco gets beat. It just doesn't happen. And so how that happened is Hillco came and recruited me because I happened to beat one of their largest clients. And, you know, right out of under, I was like two years out of undergrad when that happened, and that was, you know, pretty good money for somebody who was just out of undergrad. So I really couldn't turn it down. And that's kind of how I fell into things. And I never loved lobbying. I never loved it. And uh, that's why I made the decision to go to, to HEB. And I think that I would only lobby for uh, clients and for a company who I, I, I truly believe in because it's very easy to get disillusioned in the lobby world and, and with the politics of it. You have to truly love um, impacting change. And uh, you have to be extremely resilient and, um, and constantly not be jaded by, by, by things that happen. So it's something I constantly struggle that I struggled with, and I was very happy to get off of that lobbyist list as soon as I could. Um, but it's a good question. So I, I'll add that I love lobbying. I think it's <laughs> fantastic. And it, and, but it goes to show, too, being true to who you are and what you like and what drives you and what you're comfortable with. But, uh, but it's a little different for me, too. I'm in-house, and I work for a municipal utility. So we don't have a, public, a, a political action committee. And there, there are things that we are not doing. So it's about substance, and it's about building those relationships and being a trusted resource. I'm constantly challenged every day with finding out who's, who's now coming into the legislature, or who's now in Congress, who's appointed to this, this agency, and who do we have to go in and build a relationship with. And let's make sure they know who CPS Energy is, and let's make sure they understand our goals and our objectives for this community, and that they recognize it's a community-owned utility. I, I get up every day, and I am so impassioned by what I do. And when I get to go into the state capitol, I find it to be a tremendous honor to be there. Uh, I feel the same way about being in DC. So it's, it's a true passion. Uh, there, there are a lot of opportunities that probably come and go, and it would be really hard for me to leave this one. And notice, while the mic is coming up, notice that, that this wasn't a skill that they highlighted uh, that was before, but knowing where to find information and doing your homework um, seems to be really key mm -hmm. here in terms of this particular career path. So, yeah, my name's West Boudreau. I'm with Austin Community College. And this question is more pointed toward uh, Kathy, here at CPS Energy. So, uh, I'm a local business owner in Austin, and we work with Austin Energy not a lot um, on energy management projects, lighting, sure. solar, things like that. I was wondering what you, and anybody really, but like specifically with your case, I mean, what do you do whenever the public opinion is trying to get you guys to allocate funding for a lot of different technologies that might not make the most sense and might not provide the best return on investment just because they don't have to knowledge or other various reasons. I mean, how do you combat and make the public citizens happy and allocate the funding for, you know, that resources that will actually improve the overall results, you know what I mean? Like, for example, there's a whole nuclear argument versus, you know, the wind turbines and storage and just things like that right. in any kind of regard sample. I mean, how do you yeah, well, that's tough. Mm -hmm. uh, so municipal utilities are accountable to their owners, which is everyone that lives in that community, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial. And those are very, very different customer classes, and they're difficult to please with one fell swoop. So it's a challenge, but that is the beauty, in, in my opinion, the beauty of a municipal utility is it is accountable back to its customers. And, and you bring up Austin Energy and CPS Energy, they're different models and they're structured a little differently even though they are municipal utilities. So I'll speak to CPS Energy uh, in the fact that uh, CPS Energy's, the way it's structured uh, is that it, it provides a return back to its investor, which is the city. And so those dollars that CPS Energy sends back to the city help to pay for the variety of things that the city wants to do, whether it be parks, police, libraries. Uh, so it's, it's a partnership in the ownership. The city owns the municipal utility and the municipal utility sends revenue back uh, as part of its return on the investment. So when you talk about trying to please 
everyone in a, in a situation, that is difficult to do. It can be turbulent at times, but it is one of the best forms of local control that exists, where the customers are, are asking, demanding that the utility do certain things. And we have an obligation to listen and to try to deliver on that. And generally, we try at CPS Energy, the, the leadership tries to be uh, diverse and try to, uh, to manage all those interests by bringing stakeholders to the table, by listening to what the community has to say, by holding town hall meetings and allowing the community to have a say. So we, we work very hard. We pride ourselves on, on trying to do just that. So this question might actually be more for Brian, but if you guys can answer it, because um, it seems like you guys already work for pretty awesome companies. Not that you don't, but um, so my experience with higher education is there's, they have so many things to focus on and what they want to do. Um, what advice would you have for anyone who wanted to go to a higher institution or a company who wants to civically engage not only those people who are in that community or in that institution, but also in the community <coughs> that surrounds it. So I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, but how do you do that when they have other goals and other things that they want to accomplish, and that's kind of on the back burner? How do you make that important to someone? Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. So um, there are a lot of competing interests in higher education. Is that what you're getting? So for example, UTSA, the big interest is that we become a tier one institution, you know, re heavily on, on the research angle of things. And at times, you know, that's, that's the focus and the priority pretty much now. So at times, this whole piece of community engagement, we want to ensure that we don't lose that, that angle of the institution because it is part of our mission. Public service and community outreach or community engagement is a big part. And so that's why I'm here. I mean, that's part of, of the reason of having staff members in, in higher education focused on this work to kind of continue to steer the mission back that way when we, when we drift off too far on, on one angle. And, and what I hope to do is kind of marry the two. So the idea of community-based participatory research or community-based research um, you know, is really engaging faculty and students in the community on important issues of research that can impact public policy or shape public policy in many different ways. Um, and so trying to help, help those things kind of come together, I think, are, are really important. Um, in terms of a career in this angle in higher education, um, it's really interesting. There's a lot more that we know now in terms of some studies that have been, been done over the last few years, and there's actually a, an effort underway now of looking at what are the criteria that, that um, one needs to be a community engagement professional in higher education. So there's, um, I think it's the, it's a partnership with Campus Compact. Campus Compact is a national organization of affiliated institutions of higher ed um, looking at these issues of, of community engagement in higher education. And so they're working on a, a pretty long-term initiative right now looking at what are the criteria that one needs, what are, what are ways for people to prepare for these types of profession in higher education. Um, you know, because there, there are a number of ways of being engaged in in community engagement initiatives in higher ed, so institutes of economic development, for example, like we have here, or uh, P20 or P16 initiatives where you're engaging K through 12 education and sort of the pipeline, uh, extended education, the work, the work I do in civic engagement. So there are a number of kind of different ways to, to be engaged in roles professionally that way. Um, but it's, an, it's a growing field. There's a growing field of study. Uh, I just saw, a statistic the other day in the last 30 years, I think it's the last 25 or 30 years, there's almost been a journal a year. So we now have about 30 to 40 academic journals focused on community engagement in higher education um, that are publishing scholarship and work of both students and faculty on this topic. So I have a question too. So an issue that students sometimes come to me with is um, how do I know it's time to move on? when they're out there, they've entered their first job, and it's either a bad fit or they want to move up and take on something new. How do you make that determination? <laughs> so if I had an employee come in and ask that, uh, I, I think a candid conversation would take place. It is, 
is that person growing? Are they still facing challenges? Have they mastered, truly mastered, what they're doing? And are they ready for that next step? How has that next step been defined in their mind, possibly versus my mind, if it's maybe within the same organization or, for instance, at, at the utility? So I, I think it's about making sure that you have open, candid conversations with, with someone and really identifying the goals that you want to achieve and is the current position that you're in giving you the opportunity to, to work and achieve on those goals? And if you've accomplished those, can you, can you realign and recalibrate? Is there more to be done? Or have you reached the potential there? And hopefully, whoever you're working with and for will be honest in that regard and help, help you to define what that next step is and what those, those next set of goals look like and what your next challenges look like. I think um, there's a really great book out there and workbook uh, by uh, Bill George called True North uh, that's a really great resource. Um, we used it at Harvard Business School. He's also a professor there, and I think that kind of addresses this issue. And what I've learned from that and, and in the different positions I've been in is it's time to move on when you stop learning, mm -hmm. when you feel like you're not learning anymore. Um, and another critical decision that you're going to have to make is who you work for. Um, you want to be working for somebody or for a group that has your best interest in mind that is going to coach you to higher levels and somebody that you respect, that uh, you align with their values. Um, it's much like, you know, selecting, I imagine, a, a, a partner, a life partner. You know, is this company, is this organization somebody who aligns with your values, aligns with what you believe in in life? And are you learning from, from them? Uh, right now, if you think you're working for somebody who you don't respect and you think they're unethical, it's time to move. It's time to go. And that happens a lot in politics. It will happen a lot in policy and uh, in the corporate world. I, uh, I remember defining moments. Like, I, I knew I was done at, at certain levels in my life. And uh, making that bold decision to, to move on and to seek out those people who you align with their values is the most critical, critical thing. Kathy Bryan, we have time for one more question. Hi. So my question, uh, Dia, you really have touched on it a couple times, which was when you're working in public policy or in politics it's different than another career path because the things that you're advocating for have impacts on people's lives. Um, so like in a really real way. So you all obviously have your personal beliefs. Uh, and how do, you, how do you square the circle kind of between career advancement and your personal beliefs or, or whatever it is? And, and maybe you could talk about a time or two that you've had to choose between those things. Yeah, I've, um, you know, I've been put in a lot of very um, compromising uh, situations with, with clients that I did not believe in, in how they were treating people or what they wanted me to lobby for. And um, you have to make those difficult decisions. I mean, I'm in a very fortunate position right now that I work for a, a group and a company and a group of partners who um, uh, I walk into work every morning and I think, who can I help today? And knowing that if I make a decision um, for the right thing for our customers and for our employees, there's, there's going to be no wrong decision made there. And that's a really happy place to be. Um, but that's not always the case. It's actually pretty rare. And uh, in the policy world, so I know a lot of career fantastic policy people um, who have made a very, very good career, uh, long-term policy professionals like um, a really good, good friend of mine that some people from Austin here may know, Don Green, who was um, at the Legislative Budget Board for years, served as a director of budget for, um, for Speaker um, Craddock, and uh, is now you know, the CFO, I guess, at, at uh, TR, at uh, the Texas Retirement, or the ERS, Employee Retirement. He was served on the board there. Long-term policy professional, very, very respected in the state. That's on the policy side, and great policy people can, can work through politics, can work through parties, can exist and, and achieve really high levels of government despite their politics. And their personal politics never impact 
uh, their careers because they are really, really good at what they do on the policy side. That's possible. There are, we have a lot of extremely uh, talented policy uh, professionals. Uh, John, John Keel, who recently retired as a state auditor, is one of them, who's a long-term policy professional, worked through many different pol political situations. On the politics side, you really, have to, you really have to be careful who you choose to work for. And that's my, my best uh, advice. Kathy, you want to add anything? Uh, to that, I, I would add that it, it is about aligning with an organization that you feel strongly working for. If you are questioning that, that you feel uncomfortable with what you're doing or doesn't align with what you believe in, it, it might be worth looking for something different. I, I think uh, in the world of politics, you will get faced with that a lot. And you just have to be true to who you are, and you have to uh, know what you what you're willing to do, and um, and hopefully you can find a good fit where where you feel very comfortable and empowered in the right ways to do the things you're being asked to do. Thank you so much. And um, I always knew Dia was awesome. Uh, yeah. I just just reiterated it. Brian is fantastic to work with here at UTSA, and now I have a a newfound uh, respect. Uh, for CPS Energy and okay. what they have with Kathy Garcia. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to break the panel, but what we're going to do is real quick, we're going to uh, do an exercise with all of our um, conference goers. So if everybody can stand up in your where your seat is, and then the front row...